Uh, today, Yang and I will be giving an intro and deep dive of Kubernetes uh, Six Storage. My name is Xing Yang. I work at VMware in the Cloud Native Storage team. I'm also a co-chair of uh, Six Storage. And I am Jan Schafranek. I'm from Red Hat. I work on OpenShift Storage, and I am tech lead of Kubernetes Storage. So, uh, what are we talk? What are we going to talk about? Uh, we will talk about what is Six Storage what we did in a couple of past releases, uh, what is being developed right now, and most importantly, how to get involved. In the end, we would like to have some time for question and answers. And so, uh, what actually is special interest group dash storage? Uh, it's a pretty loose group of people. We don't have any uh, onboarding process or uh, graduation, you just come and uh, contribute and that's how you become part of Six Storage. We have two co-chairs, uh, Sadali from Google and Xing Yang from VMware. And we have two tech leads, Michelle O from Google and me from Red Hat. We have uh, quite some uh, CSI channels on Kubernetes Slack. Here are, the, here are some numbers from the biggest one. Uh, the main Six Storage channel has 5,000 people on them on it, but that doesn't mean that, that everybody contributes. Like most people, they just come and ask or find something in the history and never say anything on the channel. And the group that actually does uh, triage issues, answer the questions, uh, write pull requests, fix issues, work on new features, this is pretty small group. Uh, we have a regular bi-weekly storage. Uh, Zoom meeting. On average, we have 24, 25 attendees, but again, not everybody is speaking. I would say like 30% is active and the rest, the rest is just listening. And throughout the time, we accumulated uh, 30 unique uh, SIG uh, approvers from our SIG in our different repositories and uh, directories and directories of different repositories. Uh, what we do, uh, we have a charter for that. Uh, we basically maintain the storage APIs for users, like persistent volumes, persistent volume claims, snapshots, snapshot content, storage classes, volume snapshot classes, volume attachments, uh, storage capacities, and so on. So all, all the APIs exposed in Kubernetes related to storage, we maintain them. We also maintain the implementation of those API, APIs in Kubernetes. And on the bottom end, uh, we maintain Kubernetes volume plugins that are in Kubernetes slash Kubernetes repository, like NFS, like uh, Ceph RBD, and so on, uh, except for secret config maps, then downward APIs, pro projected and empty dirs, we co-maintain them with sick nodes because sick node knows better than us how to get a secret in Kubelet. They already have functionality for that and we know how to mount volumes and present it to users, uh, to pods. Uh, we also created and maintain the container storage interface, CSI, and we maintain the Kubernetes implementation, both in Kubernetes slash Kubernetes repository and in many of our CSI sidecars. But uh, we don't maintain too many CSI drivers. Uh, we maintain the generic ones like NFS, like Samba, but most of the mm, better, well, not they aren't better, but uh, more important drivers are uh, owned by SIG Cloud provider, like uh, CSI drivers for AWS or the cloud, or the clouds, or other community. For example, Rook maintains the CSI driver for Ceph RBD and CephFS. And we also started container object storage interface, uh, which is our attempt to provide object storage to pods, and object storage in this case means like S3 buckets uh, and similar uh, object storages. <laughs> this is in alpha yet. So uh, what we did in 126 uh, SGA, uh, in 126 uh, we allow CSI drivers to opt in for applying FS group. Uh, to volumes. 
Uh, FS group is Kubernetes mechanism how to uh, allow a random pod that runs as a random user, run, random group, uh, to access data on a volume that again is owned by random user, random group. So uh, with FS group, uh, Kubelet basically uh, changed ownerships of all files on a volume so the pod can read it, they can access it. Uh, this is slow and uh, some storage backends have a better options how to do that. So if the storage backend can, has, has some better way how to apply FS group to a volume, they can opt in. This is really dedicated only to special CSI drivers like, like Samba, where you can uh, apply FS group using mount option, for example. If your CSI driver doesn't have any such option, please use Kubernetes uh, functionality because uh, if we improve it or anybody improves it, then all CSI drivers will benefit from that, not only your CSI driver users. Uh, SGA, we also are continuing with CSI migration and we have uh, Azure file and vSphere CSI migration. That means that users can still use the old Azure file and vSphere storage classes, persistent volumes. They don't need to change anything. However, when they upgrade to 126, all the storage work will be done by CSI driver and not by kubelet. So, uh, Again, from user perspective, nothing changes. From admin perspective, uh, they need to install the driver, of course, but it should be seamless for users. As beta, we are improving how storage class is applied, how default storage class is applied to uh, persistent volume claims. Uh, if you know something about default storage classes, it's just an annotation on a storage class and if there is no default storage class at the point when user creates persistent volume claim asking for this default storage class, then this persistent volume claim will be never dynamically provisioned. It will stay pending forever, basically. So we fix that uh, when you create a persistent volume claim first, asking for default storage class and the default storage class later, we will, re we will retroactively change the persistent volume claim and it will get uh, provisioned from the default storage class. Also, if you get, have two or more default storage classes for a short time, uh, persistent volume claims will get some of them and they will not return error. And uh, I would like to dive deeper into non-graceful node shutdown, which is a new feature in Kubernetes 126 as beta. Uh, first, what is a graceful node shutdown? Uh, it is a Kubernetes feature uh, in kubelet uh, and it handles situation when user wants to turn off a node. So they SSH to a node, uh, issue a command to power off the machine or they use some API to gracefully shut down, to send a shutdown signal to the node. And kubelet will gracefully stop all the containers, it will unmount all the volumes and it will mark itself as uh, not available. That's graceful node shutdown. When you can SSH to a machine and shut it down. A non-graceful node shutdown is uh, when you can't SSH to a node. For example, the network is split, there is a hardware failure somewhere on the way or even in the machine, in the node. Uh, you cannot panic, kubelet gets stuck, whatever happens in the node, you can't SSH to it, you can't shut it down. Uh, it's something like fencing. It's, we are getting closer to fencing. We don't have fencing yet, but uh, in 126, uh, if you want to use the feature, the expected workflow is that, of course, you enable the uh, feature gate, node out of service volume detach <laughs> feature gate. Uh, then the cluster admin or some per third party software detects that the node is unhealthy or the network is split or whatever. Again, cluster admin or third party software shuts down the node uh, using either physically going to the machine and turn it off or using IPMI, using uh, iDRAC, using cloud APIs, whatever. And uh, that's still nothing new. You could do it even before, but uh, if you do it in Kubernetes 125 without this feature, then you need to wait six minutes for, Kubernetes, uh, for the control manager to, to see that the node is not available. And uh, after six minutes, 
we detach volumes from that node only after six minutes. Uh, with this improvement in 126, if cluster admin or third party software uh, applies a taint, uh, no, node kubernetes.io slash out of service, we will kill all the pods immediately or delete them because we can't kill them on the node because it's not available. And we will detach all the volumes at once. So uh, the replacement pods that need the volumes can start on different node quickly. You, you don't need to wait for this magic six minutes. And as alpha in 126, uh, you can provision volumes across namespaces, either from other volumes like cloning or from snapshots. <laughs> And uh, tomorrow there will be a talk by Masaki and Takufami. Please uh, go there if you are interested. I will not go into the details. And in 127, uh, that's a picard by Jink. Or Shink, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, thanks, Jan. So I will talk about what we did in 1.27 release. You can see that we moved a lot of features to beta in 1.27. We have a secure Linux relabeling feature uh, that speeds up the container startup time by mounting volumes with the correct secure Linux label instead of changing each file and volumes recursively. We also have a robust volume manager reconstruction feature. This is a refactoring of the volume manager code. It allows Kubelet to provide more information about how existing volumes are mounted and this will help us to rebuild and clean up the volumes at the kubelet restart time. And we also have node expand secret. This allows the CSI driver to pass the secret information to the storage system when the file system is expanded on the node during volume expansion. And we also have a feature that we co-owned with Seek Apps, uh, where we provide an option to allow the PVCs created by the staple sets to be deleted automatically when the staple set is deleted. In 1.27, we also have this uh, rewrite once pod persistent volume access mode. This is a new access mode that we added. So in CSS spec, there are a few access modes. One is called a single node writer. That means that the volume can be published uh, on a node as we write only once at any given time, but it did not specify whether that means only one pod or multiple pods can access the volume. So we uh, introduced two new access modes. One is called single node, single writer that restrict the access to that volume by just uh, uh, one pod on that node. And this is corresponding to this uh, new uh, rewrite once pod PV access mode in the Kubernetes. And also there is another new mode, a uh, single node multi-writer that allows multiple pods to access the volume on that node. So this is uh, corresponding to rewrite once uh, PV access mode in Kubernetes. If a CSI driver do not support this new modes, then it can still use a single node writer. That's the existing behavior. In 1.27, we also have uh, an option to prevent unauthorized volume mode conversion. This also moved to beta. Without this feature, we can create a, a PVC from a volume snap snapshot and convert the volume mode from file system to Roblox or vice versa without any control. This could potentially introduce security problems. On the other hand, the ability to change volume mode from file system to Roblox and retrieve changed logs is a uh, valid use case for efficient backups. So we need to be able to support it. Uh, so we added this feature. We introduced uh, some API changes in the volume snapshot content we added a new field, uh, source volume mode. The snapshot controller will be populating this field from the volume mode field in the original PVC. And 
uh, when user wants to create a PDC from a volume snapshot, the external provisioner will be checking this uh, volume mode field. If the PDC's volume mode is different from the source volume mode in volume snapshot content, it's going to take a look and see if there is an annotation called allow volume mode change on the uh, volume snapshot content. And if that is set to true, if it's true, then you can proceed. Otherwise, uh, the request will be rejected. Since this feature is a beta in 1.27, we are planning to enable the feature flag prevent volume mode conversion by default in the snapshot controller and CSR provisioner in the sidecar release for 1.28. So if your workflow uh, requires volume mode <coughs> conversion, please make a change accordingly. Otherwise, it's going to fail. In 1.27, we introduced an APA feature to support volume group snapshot. We already have a volume snapshot API that is for individual snapshots. However, some sorted systems will be able to create a crash consistent snapshot across multiple volumes. This is a very useful feature if you have an application that uses multiple volumes, for example, one for the data, one for the logs, you want to be able to take a snapshot at the same point in time across all the volumes that are used by the application to ensure right order consistency. So uh, in this feature, we uh, added a few new Kubernetes APIs. We uh, introduced the volume group snapshot API. This is a uh, user namespace object. It represents a user's request for a group snapshot. And also a volume group snapshot content. This is a cluster so scope. It represents a group snapshot on the SORD system. And also a volume group snapshot class uh, that defines uh, how a group snapshot should be created. This is defined by the admin in the cluster scope. It uh, includes information such as the CSR driver name and the deletion policy and so on. And also uh, there are AP, uh, CSI spec changes. We introduced a new group controller service. And uh, for this new controller service, we uh, have a new capability and uh, three new gRPC interfaces, create, delete, and get volume group snapshots. So if a CSR driver wants to support this new feature, it needs to implement this uh, new group control service and the three new gRPC interfaces. And we added the uh, uh, new control logic in the snapshot controller and the CSI snapshot sidecar to support this new feature. If you want to uh, dynamically provision a volume group snapshot, then you need to specify a label selector in the volume group snapshot spec so that the snapshot controller will find the PVCs with the matching label to snapshot them together. So CSI migration uh, is a feature that we have been working on for several releases. And <coughs> in 1.25, uh, the CSI migration core feature moved to GA. And also uh, OpenStack Cinder, Azure Disk and File, AWS EBS, GCP D and vSphere, all moved to GA. And uh, uh, a few of the plugins, entry plugins, have already been removed. And some of them are targeted for removal in later releases. You can refer to this table for the status <coughs> of the CSI migration. And this table shows the entry driver removal. Uh, these drivers do not go through CSI migration. In 1.26, we removed the cluster FS entry driver. There are also a few features that are in design prototyping. Change block tracking, this is a feature 
that the data protection wing group has been working on. We want to design new APIs and uh, uh, some common approach to be able to retrieve changed blocks of the data. This is uh, for uh, efficient backups. So if you're interested in this feature, join the data protection wing group meeting that happens bi-weekly on Wednesdays for this discussion. And there's also a Kubernetes volume provisioned I.O. Uh, this feature is also being designed right now. We're trying to design APIs to dynamically provision and modify uh, IOPS and throughput of, pers of persistent volumes. And also uh, we have a runtime assistant mounting of persistent volumes and uh, volume expansion for safer sets. Those features are also design in progress. So if you are interested, you take a look at the cap and join the discussion. So now let me talk about how to get involved. We have a SIG storage community page. This page has a lot of information to help you get started. There is a contributing page there uh, that has links uh, from some previous uh, presentations and we also have our bi-weekly meetings on Thursdays. Uh, in that meeting, we go over the features we are targeting for every release and making sure that they are on track. And also, we recently added a new meeting. We have a weekly issue trial meeting on Wednesdays. So uh, if you are interested in contributing to Six Storage, I strongly encourage you to join our meetings. We also have mailing list and uh, Slack channels. Um, and this Friday, there is a SIG meet and greet, and Yang and I will be there, so join us if you are around. Here are some additional resources for your reference. That's all for our presentation today. Thank you all for coming. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, elaborate a bit more on the functionality of the change block tracking functionality. What, uh, because, for example, we use vSphere as an underlying infrastructure, and there we already have it enabled on the hypervisor level. Mm -hmm. But uh, what does it actually do at the uh, Kubernetes container volume level? At container level, you could use the same APIs you're using the ATP APIs, right? You could use that same APIs, but here we are just trying to uh, have some common APIs in Kubernetes. Uh, so allow you to retrieve those blocks. Let's say you have two snapshots, you want to get the diffs. You want oh. to be able to provide the some snapshot handle and get that. And make the backup more efficient. Yeah. Uh, efficiently. Yeah. The primary okay. use case is backup. So backup vendors will use this API to get the changes between two snapshots and backup just the f bits they need to backup. Yeah. Thank you. Any other question? Just as a bit of a follow-on to the CVT, so what's the sort of timeline and, and, and what kind of things do you need to help move it forward? For a CVT? Yeah. Oh, uh, please come to our <laughs> <laughs> data protection group meeting. That well, Yeah, tomorrow. I'm hoping to okay, join so the session after tomorrow as well. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, sure. Um, but so the meet meetings are bi-weekly, you say, yeah? Yeah, tomorrow there was a session, yeah, but I think but that session, uh, yeah, yeah, sure, you can do it. <laughs> I won't be there, I just want to say, because I have a conflict, sorry. Um, but we do have uh, uh, bi-weekly meetings. We actually have been discussing that for quite a while now. Uh, there are some design details we have not finalized. There are some concerns. Initially, we were trying to uh, use an aggregated API server, but API reviewers have some concerns on the performance impact on the API server. Okay. Too much data. Um, so um, we are trying a different approach. Uh, so still in discussion, uh, if you want to know the details, please join and help us uh, finalize the design. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll join the That will meeting. be awesome. Um, all right.
example, and save it back here. So one question to the uh, stuff you uh, mentioned in the first stuff. You mentioned a six minutes magic, six minutes. What yeah. did you mean by that? Uh, initially in Kubernetes, uh, we added a six minute timeout to, uh, so when a node gets unavailable and we don't know it yet in Kubernetes uh, and somebody deletes a pod that uses a persistent volume. We give kubelet on that node six minutes to unmount the volume and after those six minutes we force detach the volume if cluster API allows or cloud API allows or if we have API to detach the volume. So the volume could get corrupted but in some cases it will help you to start a new pod on a different node with some data that was on the volume. Uh, with the ungraceful node shutdown, you can shut down the node and detach the volumes faster. Does it answer your question? Uh, yes, I guess. I'm just wondering what is ab about this, un this graceful shutdown, ungraceful shutdown, because usually if you have the situation that it does not work, the node, it, you can try to cordon it or you just plug, plug off if you use a vSphere or some, like, uh, something similar. So I'm not really sure what is the use case of that actually like mm, all the if other I can just remove if I can just remove the node I can I can use the existing functionality to, to, to have something uh, right now so yeah you can but not in Kubernetes API if you delete a node in Kubernetes API then nothing really happens the node is the, the virtual machine is still there it's still working it still has volume attached volumes attached so yeah, but assuming I have the access to the to the to the underlying architecture. Yeah, then th th of course you can use the cloud API, but people yeah. usually want to use just one a API. Then see, that's usually Kubernetes. So I think actually without this feature, you can manually achieve that. You can actually just uh, um, forcefully deleting the pods. That will also happen, but we what uh, this one just added a little bit, uh, make it more formal, uh, and also it's a Kubernetes way. Right, so if you just add apply that uh, uh, annotation there, and then also as Yang was saying that you don't have to wait for that six minutes, additional six minutes, because what just happened automatically after that. So make it more um, smoothly, but right now still need a little bit of a manual thing because you ha you still have to go apply that that annotation. So we are trying to the next step is that we are trying to see if we can make this more automatic which is you know, completely <laughs> automated, this, but that's, we're not there yet. But this is like one step further. You can, right now at least you can add some, maybe admin can add something on top of this one. You can just uh, apply that annotation. Instead of you go, you know, forcefully use another command to delete the pods, that's not very nice. Thank you. Okay. There was another question somewhere here. Uh, yeah, I'm, I want to ask: Is there also are there also plans to uh, create a compliant archive image? Uh, what do you mean compliant? Uh, compliant will say that it can never be changed for a certain period anymore. Uh, Perhaps you I thought about that. Uh, of an uh, image, for instance, or well, we don't care about images in six storage we care about persistent volumes only and volumes yeah okay. we, only, we don't pull images <laughs> okay and we don't we are not responsible for image store on nodes or how it gets stored on the nodes we don't that's sick node okay so. any other question sorry <laughs> Yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, thanks first for working on the consistent uh, volume snapshotting, the volume oh. group snapshotting. So, question is about that. If there's already some CSI driver that supports that, uh, uh, well, they may uh, do something you know, underneath. Yeah. But uh, this this feature is not a Kubernetes feature yet. Before we introduce this group snapshot API. Yeah. Okay. Are you asking if there are already CSI drivers supporting it, or are you asking about future? Are there any drivers? Yeah, I, mean, I think we're planning to add support to our 
Oh, when it's uh, there, will yeah. It, uh, yeah. So right now, this is just, uh, we, are, we just introduced this feature to Alpha, so we will be waiting for uh, sort of vendors to implement this feature. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay. No, I'm just uh, thinking, thinking ahead. ahead. Yeah, yeah. 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 Going up there. We're gonna be the first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other question? Yes, hi. Um, I just wonder why it's not possible to mount as a, a PVC in the same pot twice on a different mount points. Uh, well, I think it is. Um, uh, uh, is it now supported? Because in, in GKE it's not possible. Like uh, it, in Fox Like with Fox down with different subpasses, so um, it, it you can only mount it once. So. No, like it's it's not in the pot spec you have like uh, generic volume section, then you declare like what volumes you use, and then you have in each container you have volume mount section, and you can mount each volume multiple times in different places as you want. I'm pretty sure GKE supports that. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, it's about w something you said at the beginning about the storage classes. There oh. could, could be a, a moment where there are two default storage mm -hmm. classes. And you said that Kubernetes would decide for Yeah, one it will pick some. Uh, it's deterministic. Uh, it will choose the one with newest creation timestamp, which is not something you should depend on. It's just some, some so, so we have something deterministic. But if there are... Uh, the problem is if you want to change the default storage class, you can either delete the old default storage class and create new, and then, then you have some mean time when there is no default, we fix that. Or you can, you can create two default storage classes and delete the old one, mm -hmm. the, the old default storage class. And then you have some, some short time when you have two default storage classes and we pick that one with has newer creation timestamp, but it, you should not depend on that behavior. You, it's racy yeah. anyway. <laughs> yeah. have two I was thinking that I mean, there is a very short time if someone is just well, deleting. It the depends on you. Like yeah. uh, I, I, on the cluster, I mean, they can leave cluster with two default storage classes for a long time if they want. I don't know why would they do that. We will consistently pick the one with newest creation time. Yeah, stamp. my point is, to me, it would be wiser to not spawn the pods until they, because that is a mistake to me. I mean, it seems to be a kind of I forgot to remove. Yeah, yeah, I did. The I defined two twice that the default storage class. Uh, that's what we did. Uh, uh, when in older Kubernetes, when you had two default storage classes and you create new PVC, then you get uh, 400 error that the PVC is not valid because there are two def default storage classes. Yeah. And that's not user friendly <laughs> because user needs to go to the cluster admin to fix that and go back. So we choose some default storage class among these two or three or four. How many? How many you have? Yeah. So, if I am a distracted user, like I am actually, uh, I could then live with two default storage classes for a while with before I realize that I'm allocating yeah. storage in a wrong place. We have an alert for that. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> just my comment. We have an alert for two default storage classes. Okay. Here. <laughs> uh, sorry, it's related to that. Uh, so, um, if you accidentally delete. Uh, one storage class and you have PVCs belonging to that storage class, those PVCs get orphaned somehow, okay? And as far as I remember, uh, you it's difficult to delete them if they are not belonging to an existing storage class. Is there anything in place to solve this kind of problems? Uh, like ideally, uh, the storage class should be used only during dynamic provisioning. And ideally, all the information from the storage class should bubble up into the PV. So when you delete the storage class, you don't need you don't need it to delete the persistent volumes. I know there are some cases, some storage backends that they they need the storage class during dynamic deletion, but I would suggest to fix them to put all the information from the storage class to CSI volume attributes or volume context, and so it's there. Uh, available for the deletion or resize or whatever they need. So is there any way to patch the PVCs to, you know, uh, to a different storage class just to make them nope. easier to delete them? No. Okay. No way. Uh, the storage class field is sticky. Once it's set, it's okay. not possible to change it. Thank you. <laughs> 
for come. Okay, that's the first. Uh, hi, uh, so with, with this discussion about several default storage classes, uh, another kind of question idea. Let's say we have a stateful set which contains, uh, let it be Elasticsearch, yes? And let's, it has three replicas and uh, then uh, we want to have uh, this PVC is provisioned by stateful set in different storage classes because storage class one is uh, uh, data center one and storage class two is data center two and storage class three is data center three. Mm -hmm. Are there any plans to actually implement like uh, round robin, so to say, or random choice of default storage class and a colleague <laughs> of mine, Andre, can maybe expand his idea of his implementation, but... Not across storage classes. Okay. Uh, you can have uh, one storage class uh, that can provision volumes in all data centers and then volume topology uh, feature, topology, volume topology uh, ever provisioning uh, and node uh, zone anti-affinity in your pods will make your pods, still set pods schedule in different zones and the volumes will be provisioned for them in these different zones. So you, ha you have one storage class, but it can provision uh, storage in different zones, regions. Here. Hi, hello everyone. So while talking about volume snapshot groups, I think we said something for dynamically provisioning, we have to apply labels. Uh, can we briefly talk about that? Because if I, am, if I am correct, in case of volume snapshots, we don't have to apply any labels, obviously. So, so how is it different? Why do we have to apply labels in case uh, of volume snapshot groups? Thank right, you. This is because we just uh, uh, introduced this one volume group snapshot, I mean, actually three, but they're all about a volume group snapshot, but we don't really have a uh, API object that hold all the volumes, right? So we need to have a way to say what volumes you want to uh, you want to be grouped together, right? So this uh, this label is basically just to say, hey, here are all the volumes. They are in the same application. They have this label. Let's put them in the group snapshot. Same the same group snapshot. Yeah, we initially actually in the, in the earlier version of the design, we actually had a uh, volume group construct that was the initial design, but it just uh, getting very complicated, so that means we'll introduce six new API objects. And then also uh, the original plans to have that support both group snapshot and also group replication. Um, but it's just because of the complexity, then we decided just to, uh, for the group snapshot, we just to use this one, one set of uh, constructs. Yes. Unfortunately, we're out of time. <laughs> so thank you for the questions. Thank you. Thank you.